don't have to be interested in every field you want to do. Now, don't worry, you're not being graded. Um, so, SVT is a very important subject. Um, what does SVT mean when you hear the term? SVT. Coming above the metric. Right, okay. That is exactly right, and that is the broader definition, but like everything in life, a lot of things we define are actually not how we use it for, right? <clears throat> so, SVT generally refer to a group of SVT that are regular, narrow complex regular tachycardia. We never call flutter SVT because it's flutter, okay, but technically they are SVT, okay. Atrial fibrillation is also SVT, but we just call them atrial fibrillation because it's so obvious. See, we like to see things that are obvious. Everything that's not obvious, let's just give it a name, right? So SVT really is anything about ventricle, which is broadly atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and then you have uh, <clears throat> the, the, yeah, so the, that that is part of the SVT, okay? So underneath SVT are, um, now the thing with flutter is sometimes it can look like SVT. What does flutter look like when it's two to one? Regular and fast, just like any SVT, right? So that could be a masquerader for regular SVT, okay? And it's important to know the difference because the treatments are very different, right? These things you're worried about thrombus, you're worried about heart failure, but these things are just more of an inconvenience, okay? Now this is a simple way to look at SVT. What if SVT is Y complex? Can SVT be Y complex? Can he have a Y complex tachycardia that's SVT? Most likely not. What if someone has a bundle branch point to start with? So even though it's above the ventricle, right, your, your AV node, your his bundle, and your right bundle, left bundle, right? <clears throat> the AV node. And uh, uh, if you have right bundle branch block, then your V1 looks like this, right? Just in sinus. So your SVT is still going to have that. Your SVT is not going to look any prettier than when you're in sinus rhythm, right? So your SVT coming down here is going to still hit that right bundle. So you're going to have a white, a, a white complex tachycardia, even though it's it's an SVT, okay? And there, that gets you to another topic of how to differentiate white complex tachycardia, which is another hour talk by itself, which you'll you learn over the years. Uh, but let's just focus on the easily identifiable <coughs> SVT that are narrow QRS. So when something is narrow QRS, is it always SVT? Yeah. 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 Well, if someone asks a question, it's probably not, right? That's a plural in medicine, right? <laughs> if someone has to ask a question, probably not. And in, in general medicine, there's always exception to every rule, okay? Probably 99% of narrow complex tachycardia are SVT. Okay, because it comes through the his per kg fiber, right? But there's a form of ventricular tachycardia. Well, first of all, ventricular tachycardia always look Y complex, right? Does it have to be Y complex? You're shaking your head because you learned my lesson. <laughs> right, well, 99% of VT are Y complex because it comes from a ventricle, right? When it comes from the ventricle, the depolarization goes through whatever the source here and just depolarize this way. It doesn't go through the his per Kinchy nice network, right? A nice network give you that nice looking QRS. That's what those his per Kinchy fibers are for. They're for making pretty QRS is like this, right? But if you have a ventricle focus that depolarizes the, the myocardium and go through the myocardium slowly as opposed to going through the freeway of the his per Kinchy fiber, your QRS is going to get narrow. I'm sorry, it's going to get wide. It just take time. QRS is basically a recording of your activation. It takes a long time to get through the activation. It's going to look wide. Okay. That's why in hyperkalemia your QRS start widening because it takes a long time to depolarize the ventricle. Okay. So an abnormal depolarization always look like a white complex tachycardia. What if you have a tachycardia in the ventricle that goes between these two? You know, in called fascicular tachycardia. 
they can look very narrow, but they're not narrow perfectly narrow because it doesn't come from here. Okay? This is one exception to the rule of V type being wide. Is if if the tachycard involves part of a Purkinje fiber, it's depolarizing part of the ventricle, so that nice freeway that it goes relatively fast. But you would never look at exactly the same as it coming from above here because the activation is still different. Okay? So that's just one exception to the rule that all VT are Y complex. Um, but not all SVT are narrow, uh, narrow complex because if you have find a branch block, a baronetcy, then you're going to have Y complex. Okay? So going back to all the SVTs, um, you have AFib, atrial flutter, and SVT. And SVT, why do I draw these branches? Because there are different type of SVT, right? What are the ones? Someone mentioned the name earlier. Yeah. Okay. Now, what, what else? AV and RT. AV and RT. Okay. And? AVRT. AVRT spot or WBW. Atrial tachycardia. Okay. So these are broad categories. Okay. Now, with, among each, you can talk about other things. So, look at the. Basically, this is, by now you, you're probably used to looking at this, right? This is how electrophysiologists look at the heart. A little stick, man, that's all we care. Everything else doesn't matter. <laughs> Coronary artery, left main, who cares, right? This is a stick, man, is, is, is how, what's important. Now, along, around the stick, man, are two valves, right? The, you always look at the heart from the front of the patient, right? So this is a tricuspid valve, this is a mitral valve, right? Okay. So SVT is anything above the <coughs> ventricle. <coughs> um, above the ventricle. And um, so AVNRT, AVRT, and AT, okay? So AVNRT. Thank you very much, Julie. So AVNRT, uh, oh, thank you. Okay, you get an A. <laughs> AVNRT involves the uh, AV node. You know what kind of general diagram of AVNRT look like? Right? There's a slow pathway here, kind of an ill-defined tissue, and your, your fast pathway here, and that re-entry goes around here, okay? The textbook, I don't know if they still show this little circle going around, AVNRT. Yeah, it, it's obviously not that simple, right? The slow pathway is a, we still don't know. Even today, we still don't know what slow pathway looks like. We have some idea, but we don't. So it, it's something around here that conducts, competes with the fast pathway, and reentry goes around here. And the reason it's, it's superventricular is because it has to go through the his bundle, and then it applies the ventricle through the his bundle and the rest, so it looks like a sinus B, except it's fast. Okay? Then you have WPW. So who can tell me what WPW is? No, there's a delta wave. There's <laughs> yeah. a delta wave, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so all these are names you pick up reading the <laughs> textbooks, <laughs> right? But you haven't been to clinical medicine, so. All you know is what your professor wrote 50 years ago. Who knows Dr. Parkinson, Dr. White, and Dr. Wolf? You would know them as long, long <laughs> dead. Do you know when it was published? They, they discovered this even before we have electrophysiology. It's 1936, they published a paper on WPW. Now imagine, EKG was invented in 1909. Okay, so within a few years, people start seeing this crazy young woman passing out and having palpitation. Used to be called what? Hysteria, right? Well, was EKG was invented, that they start seeing a group of young people, healthy, have this bizarre, abnormal EKG with this thing that we eventually know is Delta wave. And they keep having tachycardia. And so the three together publish a paper. WPW, that's, a, that's it kind of <clears throat> stood around, but it's, it's basically an accessory pathway, right? You mentioned that word, and that's just probably the mm, 
the best way to describe it, okay? Uh, it's a pathway that is outside of the AV node, right? Between the atrium and ventricle, there's usually one single connection, the AV node, right? But for a reason we don't know, and the people are born with this, you have that extra nerve that connects. Um, and who knows where the nerve is? Where is the accessory pathway? Or it could be anywhere along the AV groove, okay? AV groove, the connection between the atrium and ventricle, okay? AV node is, is in the AV groove, it's right in between, right? If you look at the heart from sideways, it's between the atrium and the ventricle, right? So you can have a pathway there, you can have a pathway on the right side, you have a pathway all around the... The, the only place you cannot have pathway is a, is a aorta, right? If you look at the, the valves sideways, Tricuspid valve, oh, look at me, right? I have to turn, I have to turn LAO for you. Okay. So, so, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, if you look at the valve on FOSS, right? What's a circle? So there are circles around it that has both A and V connected, right? Except for one place. Aorta sits right in the middle, right? You see how aorta comes through the middle and then goes, you know, ascending aorta, right? The aorta occupies a big part of the AV groove, so the atrium, and the right the atrium, the atrium, are not completely conjoined, but they're separated by a small area. That's the only area that you cannot have a, a pathway. Everything else you can have a pathway connecting the A and V. Okay. So then, by the location of the pathway, you can tell where the pathway is on EKG. That's another lecture. Okay. Imagine your pathway coming from here. You're going to activate the ventricle like this, with the axis like this. If the pathway is here on the bottom, inferior wall, it's going to activate a pathway like this, and ventricle QR is going to look different. Okay, <clears throat> so that is an accessory pathway, and it's congenital. You're born with it, but it's not like autosomal inherited. It just happens sporadically. One in a thousand live births have a pathway. <clears throat> okay, uh, we don't see very much in adults anymore because the pediatric guys get to them before. Get to have fun with it. We used to do a lot in our training, but not in the last 15 years. Is mm. that an actual specialty then, the pediatric? Yes, pediatric yes. So, pediatric, pediatric have the pediatric cardiology. So, they are pediatricians, right? So, they're starting their pediatrics that they never, never overlap with us. Yeah. We go to adult internal medicine, they go to pediatric. Mm -hmm. Then, they subspecialize in their pediatric cardiologists. Mm -hmm. So, Unfortunately, they took all the funds away from it. <laughs> this is actually a very fun procedure to do because, you know, take an 18-year-old kid and you put a catheter in there and in 30 minutes you take care of his WPWC case, he look normal and he's cured for the rest of his life. It's like the best, one of the best thing you can do, okay? <clears throat> so that extra nerve allow conduction between the A and V in an area accessory to the AV node. That's why we call it accessory pathway, okay? Accessory pathway often can conduct both ways. As in a lot of things in, in, in EP, pathway can conduct endograde or retrogradely. Uh, some pathway conducts only retrogradely. And rarely some pathway conducts only antigradely. That's called Mahine pathway. You never ever see that, hear that term again. You never ever see a patient, but you will show up on your board. So, my <laughs> behind pathway conducts only endogradely and not retrogradely. Okay? And some concealed pathway conducts retrogradely and not endogradely. But all pathways have to conduct for it to be meaningful, right? Uh, so, when they have conduction, it gives you a back door. So, what this situation creates is like you have a door there and you have a window here. Suppose the window is open. You can crawl in through the window and come back around here and then you have re-entry. That's how re-entry occurs. You have an in and you have out. All re-entry has to have some way to go around in circle. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, WPW, now why is WPW uh, a supraventricular tachycardia. Technically, it's actually not. Right? It's been categorized, but if you think about it, it involves the ventricle. Ventricle is part of the pathway. 
because if you don't have a ventricle, the tachycardia will stop. So like AV and RT, you can if can create complete heart block, you can still have AV and AV and RT. Okay, you can have right bundle, left bundle, complete heart block, AV and RT, atrial fib still goes on. But if you take out the his bundle, your WP double tachycardia will stop. Okay. We call it narrow. If we call it SVT because it's narrow complex. But there's an exception to that. We'll get to that. Okay. So you have uh, orthodromic tachycardia. There's another term. Okay. You're gonna impress your your attendees so much if you start throwing these words out there. Okay. So you have orthodromic tachycardia, meaning that activation goes down the AV node through the normal his percutaneous fiber and then it goes out the back door and then back around in circle like this. What would that QRS look like? Why? Why would it be why? You have a different opinion. Well I think it's still traveling down the normal pathway so it would still be the narrow QRS, but then it's just coming right, back up right. and going back so down. So, the activation of this, of the ventricle, first of all, ventricle is what shows up on the EKG, right? Activation of the ventricle is going to follow the hispercutive fiber, so it's going to look exactly like sinus. Okay? Now it's going to come back here, but the, the heart is polarized the same way, whether it's in orthodromic tachycardia or in sinus rhythm. Okay? When it comes back here and it enters here, it still goes through the hypercutaneous fiber. What if the pathway conducts in an antidromic fashion, meaning it is not orthodromic anymore, it goes around the other way. It goes like this, down the pathway and up to his bundle, and down the pathway and up to his bundle. What would that QRS look like? Your ventricles de being depolarized from this point. And on. Give you your delta wave? Yeah, and not just that, it would look like V-time. Because a antidromic tachycardia that goes around like this is depolarizing the ventricle no different than if you had a VT coming from here. Imagine you happen to have a focus of VTAC at the accessory pathway and it's depolarizing the ventricle. It doesn't re-enter, of course, because there's no WVW. It's just a VTAC that happens to occur here it's going to depolarize the ventricle exactly the same way as your WP that you're going down this way because it's starting from here, right? So it's going to look not just a delta wave, but it's going to have a wide complex tachycardia looking just like VTAC. So an endodromic tachycardia looks like VTAC, and orthodromic tachycardia looks like narrow complex tachycardia, okay? Now to understand how the ventricle is activated in WPW, you should take a step back and understand what the delta wave is, right? You guys all know what delta waves is, right? So this is a this is a a, a normal EKG, and this is a delta wave, right? So why is there a delta wave? Well, then why does this part look the same? Because you're act also activating via the bundle. Exactly. So this is what we call a fusion B, right? Did someone asked me a fusion last time or was in a previous session. Okay. A fusion is basically you have two things that combine, right? Uh, so this is a, a classic fusion. This QRS is made out of two sources, one through the His bundle and one through the bypass drive. And your sinus node comes from here and comes over here and activate the AV node and then goes all the way there and then activate this and this comes down here and this comes down here simultaneously. The degree of difference will determine how big the delta wave is, right? So, um, if you, and it's called pre-excitation. Why do we call it pre-excitation? You know, they know all about this before we actually even put catheter in the heart. Some guy out there just smart enough to figure this out before we actually have electrophysiology as a specialty. It's called pre-excitation because the ventricle got activated before it should be. If you know, why is there a PR interval? You guys should know. Why is there a PR interval? Because the conduction is slower for the AV. 
that maybe you know give you a little delay, right? Just on a side note, why does the AV not need to give you a delay? I think there are two two reasons. God designed it for two reasons. So that if there's tachycardia in the atria, the ventricles don't get everything. You're protected, atria. right? If there's no delay, every time we go into atrial fibrillation, we die. Subworld overpopulation problem, but it's not very pretty. <laughs> right? So that's one thing. And number two thing, just kind of teleologically thinking, the A and B need to be synchronized with some delay. Otherwise, the heart will be beating against each other. When the atrium is squeezing, the ventricle is squeezing at the same time. And that doesn't feel very good. And that's what people with HVT do. They feel like their heart is pounding their neck. Because you can actually see the jugular vein pounding like that during SVT. The A and B are pushing against each other. Okay? So there's an AV delay naturally. So if the AV delay is very long, then this gets more accentuated. If the AV node conduct very quickly, uh, the delta wave will be kind of small, very, very, very minimal. Okay, so you can manipulate the physiology in a patient to see it. Most of the time for diagnostics, sometimes just for fun, just to demonstrate to a student. If you get a patient w, uh, WPW with adenosine, what happens? It blocks the AV node, right? And your delta wave become huge because everything is going down the lab, the pathway, okay? And if you put someone on the treadmill, typically the AV node, due to vagal withdrawal, AV node start conducting fast, and your delta wave narrow, okay? So that's, you can see a little interesting physiology if you ever deal with a patient with WPW, okay? So the, the abnormal activation of the ventricle give you the abnormal QRS, and when you're in tachycardia in this fashion, what does the QRS look like again? Like look like VT, right? It's activating in the ventricle abnormally. In an orthodromic tachycardia, it looks like yeah. narrow. Okay, so that's very simple. So next time you you see a W at SVT. And you tell your attending that is orthodromic AVRT. You'll be impressed. What did you say the other way was? Orthodromic and what? Antidromic. Okay, so that's the. Now, you have the third category called atrial tachycardia, right? Very simply, it's a tachycardia that is independent of atrium. I mean, independent of the ventricle or the AV node. So suppose you have sinus tachycardia. Strictly speaking, sinus tachycardia is a atrial tachycardia. It's in the atrium and it's called fast. Okay. And while we never call a sinus tachycardia a atrial tachycardia, it is part of a differential diagnosis. You got a patient with a heart rate of 130 with a P wave in front of QRS. Well, it's an atrial tachycardia by definition, but is it a sinus tachycardia or is it an ectopic atrial tachycardia from, coming from another focus, okay? And then that's where you need to call your EP buddy in and say, hey, help me out, you know? And if we put a catheter in there, we can map to see where it is. Uh, and if we don't, even on the EKG, you have some subtle things you can tell, right? There's, there, there, for every focus, there's a certain signature, right? You know what sinus P wave look like, right? You guys know what sinus P wave look like? Who can tell me what a sinus P wave look like? What's your gut feeling? What's your... You've seen some EKG, right? Mm -hmm. What are things that tell you, oh, a sinus rhythm? Just because there's a P wave in front of QRS, does that make it a sinus rhythm? No, it could be AVRT, it could be AVRT, it could be atrial tachycardia, right? could be flooded because you don't see the second P wave. Second P wave could be inside your QRS, and you, you could totally call it a sinus tachycardia. In fact, on the ward, a lot of times they do that incorrectly, okay? So what's a sinus P wave look like? Sorry? Uh, yeah, okay, so that's, um, are you a math major? No. <laughs> What'd you call it? Parabola. Oh, parabola. Um, yeah, 
I did a really bad recording. Let's get a better recording. Okay. So you know a sinus because there's a P wave in front of every QRS, right? So typically P wave has certain appearance, um, and we know um, P wave sits right here on the high right atrium, right? So it's going to activate the atrium in this fashion, right? So the P wave has this axis. Right? And that axis is right to left. So and high to low, right? So you infer <coughs> your inferior is gonna be positive, two, three and AVM, right? Your V one is gonna be slightly positive to mostly negative. In this case it's not very okay. And then your lateral leads are gonna be positive because it's the lateral leads are seen and going toward it. So that's what the sinus P wave look like. Okay? So just think think about what are, and same thing with ventricles. Ventricles activate a certain way because that's the orientation of your QRS, okay, of your activation. So, okay, well, no. okay. Um, so, when you have a tachycardia coming from the left side, your P is going to look totally different. So, if you think about what your P will look like in sinus rhythm. And every EKG, you look at it and go, well, this P wave, yeah, okay, that's sinus, that's sinus, that's sinus, you know. All P wave in sinus with a positive in D1, positive in 2, 3, ABF. Almost without exception. Sometimes they can look a little different. Uh, sometimes they are more negative in V1. Sometimes they are slightly positive in V1. So there could be some variation. But a few things are typically unchanged. Those three leads are, are typically very consistent, okay? So when they <coughs> monitor on, 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 on telemetry on the war, what do they monitor on? They usually monitor lead two. If you have a single lead on any EKG, it's always lead two, okay? Because that's where you can see your P wave the best. This is AVF, or there's two, okay? And your QR is always positive because your ventricle is activated like this, high to low. So lead two is a convenient lead to monitor if you only have a chosen one lead, okay? Think you know, in medicine, everything is done for a reason, you know, it's not like, oh, someone just decided to pick V2, right? You would never want to pick, say, say uh, V6 for, for, for because it's such an obscure lead. Sometimes, a, you know, well, that's not a good example. So maybe like AVR, that's a bad lead to, to, to because right. things are negative, and T wave flip and all that. So people like to look at what a normal EKG look like, which is an upright P wave, upright QRS, and then a normal T wave. Hmm. So, how do you differentiate the three different arrhythmias? Okay, and this is something that is clinically important. You will run into an SVT in the ER, okay, or in your clinic, and someone present with a tachycardia at its narrow QRS, okay, at a rate of 150. So right away, your differential diagnosis is. And it's you know it's not irregular, so you can pretty much eliminate fibrillation from this. Okay, it's a narrow QRS, regular tachycardia. But, but, but what's your differential diagnosis? Does it look like that? Like when, no I'm a bad is? artist, but it looks like that. Yes, narrow QRS tachycardia, 150. With no obvious P wave. You know, it's hard to tell P wave when you have a tachycardia like this. I'll tell you where the P wave would be. I'm sorry, the T wave. So you got a T wave there, right? Okay. So it's hidden in the T wave? Right. Your P wave could be in here, your P wave could be here, P wave could be here, or P wave could be in here. And there are different places where P wave depends on the rhythm. Okay? So you, you can, and then if you imagine that the, the, the T wave look like that. Your flutter wave could be hidden within that, okay. right? And you won't be able to see it. Shoot, I already gave you the answer. <laughs> so what are the things that this could be? Flutter. flutter. AFib will be irregular. Sometimes FIB can be temporarily look regular just for a few beats. But then if you watch it long enough, AFib cannot possibly be regular. Okay? Except one, one condition. There's always an exception. If someone has atrial fibrillation and the rate is regular, what's going on? 
digital toxicity. I give you a, um, a junction of rhythm, AV block. Okay, so that that's one area. Um, or if you have a pacemaker, okay, you can have a pacemaker that's pacing the ventricle. Your atrium is still fibrillating. Okay, so um, so one differential diagnosis flutter. What's the other diagnosis? You know, already been through it. SVT, right? SVT could be any one of those three that we talked about, right? So then the big atom crew is between flutter and SVT. What do you do to differentiate it? You got to do something more than just calling the EP guy, right? You got to say, hey, Dr. Ong, I did this and I think this is this. I want you to avoid it, right? Well, what do you do to differentiate flutter and SVT? Think about the mechanism of these arrhythmia. One is just localized to the atrium, and the other one uses AV node. So, what is the target of intervention? Is it AV node? Sorry? AV node? Yeah, AV node. Right? How do you affect the AV node without putting a catheter in the heart? Adenosine. Okay. Well, you guys are born in the post adenosine era. How about a little carotid sinus massage, okay? People training our airway try to do the free things first. <laughs> and then we, we pull out the, the, the money. So a, den, uh, a carotid sinus massage and adenosine do the same thing. Uh, or not the same thing, they result in the same effect of blocking the AV node, okay? So if you are successful in blocking the AV node, what happened to these two different major categories, okay? What happened? What happened to the flood when you block the AV node? Keeps going. Sorry? Keeps going. Keeps going, right? So instead of two to one flutter, you see three to one flutter, four to one flutter, or you you, you typically see this, and then it goes to complete heart block, and you start seeing the flutter. Of course, there's flutter in here. We just they're kind of obscured by the T wave. Okay, you go into complete heart block, and then you have a QRS, and then yeah, and then they return, okay? So what that does is it reveals the underlying flutter, makes your diagnosis, like, unquestionable. And we see that there's nothing else it could be, it's flutter, okay? Um, if it's SVT, what happened to the de with the adenosine or carotid sinus massage? Does it slow down or does it stop it? It's only two things. Stop it, right? Typically, it stops it, with one exception, right? Again, there's always exception, right? Going back to this, right? If you give a tendency to WPW, you stop it because WP will go through the AV node, either orthodromic or endodromic. It has to go through this pathway. So anytime you put something in, the, in, in a roadblock in the middle of a pathway, whether it's going this way, that way, or whatever way, if everything has to go through that place to sustain the tachycardia, and you stop it, or you, you, you put an effect on that particular structure, then you will stop the tachycardia, right? So WPW will stop. What happened to AVNRT? Stop, right? That's a classic use for AVNRT, right? What happened to atrial tachycardia? You, what? You still have it. Because it's in atrium, it's independent of AV node, okay? But there's always an exception to the rule, okay? Uh, for the purpose of your understanding, it won't affect it, right? You just block the AV node, the atrial tag just keep going. Just like sinus tag. If you block the AV node, the sinus tag will just keep going, right? Um, in rare cases, some kind of atrial tachycardia can respond to adenosine, so it can terminate as well, okay? But <coughs> in either way, your biggest differential is between these two, right? And either you, you you terminate it and go, oh shoot, I feel like a star. Now patient can go home and see his EP and follow up. Or you see the flutter and go, oh, well then let's do something about it. You give him Coumadin and you put him on Cardizam and you send him home. Or you mend him, whatever. Right? So so they need to make that differential diagnosis uh, as, a, as a first approach. Sorry, did you say that for atrial tachycardia that it's coming from the SA node? 
originating from the SA node and it's just a sinus tachycardia? Well, okay, just as a kind of a broad category, an atrial tachycardia comes from anywhere in the atrium. Mm -hmm. So technically, your sinus tachycardia is a form of atrial tachycardia. Okay. And it is a part of a differential diagnosis. Someone with, with, with palpitation put them on the holder. They go home and they come back and go, oh, it's a heart rate 150. And you see a P wave in front of every QRS, okay? It looks like sinus tachycardia. More father, you look like sinus tachycardia. So I ask the patient, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I was jogging. Sinus tachycardia. No, I was just sleeping. That's not sinus tachycardia. It could be an ectopic focus. It could be a focus very close to the sinus. No, that looked very similar to the sinus P wave. Okay? So, <coughs> angel tachycardia basically is something that coming from the atrium and doesn't utilize the AV node as a way to sustain the tachycardia. But if it's just one foci and it's hitting again and again and again, that's flutter, right? And if it's multiple foci, that's fibrillation. Okay, so well, yeah, well, so, so that gives you a whole new, whole new topic, okay? Sorry. So, <laughs> so an atrium, an atrial tachycardia, there's some physiology explanation, but Basically, atrial tachycardia go between 100 and 200, generally, SVT, okay? Um, atrial flutter, now we're talking about the atrial rate, not the ventricular rate, right? In EP, we don't care about, you know, say, heart rate is 100. I don't care what the pulse rate is. You could have aortic stenosis and no pulse, so you have coarctation and, and, and no pulse. I don't care. It's just, we, we, we're talking about what's immediate. So when you talk about atrial flutter, we talk about rate in the atrium, and we can be in complete heart block. The ventricle has nothing to do with flutter, right? So the atrial rate during SVT is usually 100 to 200. Atrial flutter, <clears throat> um, it's uh, uh, usually about 250 to 300, okay? Um, and atrial flutter is kind of your last, uh, oh, got an SVT. Okay, there. See, there's an SVT. So you you have uh, um, the atrium rotating around in the uh, the the, the, the path of rotating around the tricuspid valve. That's what give you the, the the flutter. And then you have atrial fibrillation, which is usually 300 to 400. You do. Uh, you do too. Yeah. Can um, three to four hundred. Okay. So when the atrium gets about 300, it's not able to maintain or organize activation anymore, and it would it would degenerate, and the atrium would start going 